In this video, we're going to uh, transition now from having talked about descriptive approaches to time series analysis to actually diving into some of the classical time series models. Uh, so these are going to be, uh, again, as we've talked about in the past, we're going to have a, a process model, we're going to have a data model, uh, and but you know while most of the models we talked about in the class up to now uh, assumed independence and observations, we know we now we're going to actually formally go about uh, modeling that that error structure uh, in time, so modeling temporal error structure. So we're going to, that will allow us to you know. Uh, account for that autocorrelation in terms of the information content of the data and, and how it affects uh, inference and power and uh, you know, statistical tests and stuff like that, um, and also how we make forecasts that account for that autocorrelation. So we're going to assume as a simple uh, continuing structure, we're talking about modeling some y as a function of time that can be decomposed into some trend as a function of time and some autocorrelated error. Um, and note the remaining slides are going to assume that the trend has already been removed up until uh, the point where obviously I'm going to start talking about adding trend back in explicitly at some point. But we're going to initially assume that the, the trend has been removed and we're trying to deal with the autocorrelated error and detrended data. Uh, to do this, I'm going to introduce uh, a class of models that is really core to a lot of classical time series analysis called the ARIMA class of models, uh, which stands for the autoregressive, autoregressive integrated moving average framework. It's a very general case for classic frequentist time series analysis, and you can also implement any of these uh, ARIMA models in a Bayesian context as well. And they contain a number of important special cases. And, and really what I'm going to do is go through those special cases uh, and then build back up to the full case. Uh, so they include things like autoregressive models, uh, which is where we're going to model the auto uh, correlation in the error structure exp explicitly. Uh, in terms of P here, which de des uh, describes the order or the number of lags in the autocorrelation. The integrated models, D, which describes the number of differences you've taken in the modeling of the time series. Uh, and then the moving average models, uh, which have, uh, you know, we, we talked previously about taking moving averages. Uh, so this is the degree of the moving average Q. Uh, some other special cases are ARMA models, which combine autoregressive and moving average. And the uh, Gaussian white noise model, uh, which is essentially uh, you know, a very special case uh, where all of these are set to zero. When we talk about models and the ARIMA framework, they're also often expressed in terms of the order of these three terms. So an ARIMA model is expressed in terms of P, the, degree, the lags in the auto regressive part, D, the differences in the integrated part, and Q. Uh, the moving average component, the degree in the moving average component. So to take uh, you know, this really important special case of Gaussian white noise that you know, describes the case of mean zero, constant, vari constant variance, and no autocorrelation. So in ARIMA, zero, zero, zero is just uh, random independent draws uh, from a normal distribution. So here we're seeing no trend, no autocorrelation, uh, no need to difference this time series to understand what's going on. It's just independent draws from a normal. Uh, but you know, so that's a special null case uh, of, uh, you know, yeah, it really is just the null model. Okay. So let's dive into uh, one of the most common and most important parts of the RIMA framework, which is autoregressive models. So autoregressive models say that y at time t can be predicted as, as y at time t minus 1 and potentially t minus 2 and t minus 3 and t minus 4 up to p possible lag. So the uh, p is the number of time steps in the past you look in order to predict uh, the present. 
And when we look at protecting the present, uh, we do that taking into account these parameters rho, which are these autocorrelation parameters that tell us uh, you know, kind of how much weight you give the past when predicting the present. And you could see uh, you know, this, if you look at this, the structure of this model, you could argue that it conceptually is like fitting a linear regression model against the last p values in the time series, though in practice that's not how we would actually fit an autoregressive model. Um, so, you know, one really important special case of the autoregressive model is the IR1 model, first order autoregressive model, which describes a, a, a Markov process. So an AR1 model is also an Remo 100 model because it only deals with autoregression. And uh, it's Markovian because it only deals with the previous lag. And so it's just yt equals rho yt minus one plus some error. Uh, and you can also see a, you know, an, another important special case there is if rho equals one, then that AR1 model is just a random walk model uh, same as we talked about in um, the state space models as kind of an important null case. Uh, if rho is zero, then the AR1 is the same as the AR0 because this is giving zero weight to the past. And it's just white noise and anything between one and zero is some degree of weighting. And so in particular, uh, you know, when this rho is less, uh, less than one, uh, there is this kind of decay back to um, the initial condition. And then we can see that if we look, if we are to actually calculate out uh, the expected value of y at any point in time, which is just, the, you know, again, the mean at any point of time is going to be y at y at time zero, so the initial condition times rho of t. Um, so again, in a random walk model, that is going to, rho of t, you know, uh, and rho is one, you know, that's just one raised to the t power. And so y zero just is y zero, which is what we saw in the random walk model previously. It's expected value is just the same forever. Uh, if this is anything less than one, this actually is then going to decay uh, back to zero. So if this was, you know, y zero times, you know, one half, you know, you would see that we'd go from y zero to one half, one zero to one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty two second, one sixty fourth, one twenty eighth, blah blah blah, uh, and it's really the expected value is decaying back to to zero, mean zero, which is what we have with, with the white noise process, a mean zero, um, and you know that that decay is you know gives us that characteristic kind of exponential shape. That we often see in an autocorrelation plot is that decay of the autocorrelation. Uh, the other thing we'll see, we'll dive into the math of this a little bit more soon, is the variance uh, is going to be related to you know, uh, rho squared, just the, you know, sorry, sigma squared, or, or variance at lag zero, uh, and then the sum of uh, autocorrelation terms at, at various lags uh, squared. So similar to uh, the row squared here, but uh, the row to the t here, but it's now two times that lag. Um, so the, you know, the autocorrelation is then causing, uh, you know, affecting the variance. Okay. So to dive in a little bit more deeply, um, one of the things that's going to be really important when working with uh, autoregressive models is uh, expressing this autoregression in terms of uh, how it affects the variance and how it affects the covariance and, and using this idea of autocorrelation to build up uh, the actual covariance matrices in, in within our, our data model. So as I noted previously, if, if rho is less than one, then as time increases, the expected value uh, declines to zero, and uh, the variance. Uh, and this would be a you know uh, you go back to an intro calc book and you would see the. This is just a, a, a infinite sum when this goes to, to zero and it goes to a, a specific solution. 
uh, in this case, it would go to uh, 1 over 1 minus rho squared uh, times the constant sigma out front. Um, and so you know, let's, let's think through what happens, you know, when uh, when rho is zero, then sigma is just zero. Uh, sig sorry, sigma is zero. Ah, sorry, when rho is zero, one minus rho is just one, and sigma is, you know, the variance is just sigma squared. Um, as this uh, increases the as rho increases the denominator gets smaller which means the variance gets larger uh, so we see a larger when we see an autocorrelated error we see a larger overall variance than than sigma because of the uh, accumulated impact from the previous time steps um, so if the you know variance at at infinite lag is you know rho squared of one minus or sigma squared one minus rho squared uh, then at lag s this just becomes uh, that overall solution times you know that rho at that lag so the, the auto uh, covariance at lag s is you know sigma squared uh, rho s one minus rho squared So knowing that, knowing that the covariance at lag S can be expressed in terms of rho and sigma, uh, actually then combined with this idea of station, second order stationarity, which is the covariance only depends on the lag, not depends on the point in time, actually then gives us everything we need to know uh, to actually fill in the full covariance matrix. So if we have a time series of y, y t minus 2, t minus 1, t, t plus 1, t plus 2. Uh, the covariance with y uh, is, you know, covariance at 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, um, which is just this sigma squared over 1 minus rho squared. And we just can fill in a whole vector of rows. Um, and then we can do that for every x, sorry, for every y. If we do this for every y, uh, instead of having a vector of rows, we have a matrix. Um, and in each row, the matrix were offset by one because time is moving across it. So yeah, if, for example, if we were at the start of the time series, you'd have a uh, correlation with itself. Uh, the next point in the second and the third up to the t minus one. If we're at time, if the second row, we're, we're thinking of ourselves as the second value. So we have a correlation row back to the previous one, row to the first one, to the next one, and so on and so forth. And so we can fill out this whole matrix. And this essentially this whole matrix is giving us a matrix of correlations um, which we can then scale to the overall covariance matrix um, and indeed you know one thing that's even simpler is, is you can actually express uh, a whole matrix is just the distances you know 0 1 2 3 4 5 up to t minus 1 and then you know raise row to that whole matrix. Um, so the key idea here, and this is actually, you know, the really important take home point uh, to think about and, and to take and, and, you know, apply forward, which is that uh, what we've done here is we've created a model that allows us to fill in all the covariances in a covariance matrix uh, parametrically, just as a function of, in this case, one parameter rho, because we're just dealing with a single uh, single lag autocorrelation. Uh, but the most the, the kind of important take home message that we're going to use uh, through the rest of time series models, through the rest of spatial models, through spatiotemporal models, and 
can be applied from there to uh, any other concept where correlation varies as a function of distance. Uh, phylogenetic models, data simulation models uh, are all based on this idea is that um, we have a matrix of covariances and a matrix of correlations, and we don't have to estimate all of those individual correlations independently because we can write down uh, a model for filling them in with a small number of parameters. And that, you know, once we have that full covariance matrix, uh, I would argue once you have the full covariance matrix, uh, the, um, computationally it is not simple, but conceptually, a lot of what we've talked uh, talking about we f can fall back on everything we've been doing in the past. Uh, so let's think about that, about how we ca calculate for uh, autoregression within models more generally. So we started with a case where we have an AR1 model, y of t equals rho y of t minus one plus some error by accounting for that autocorrelation, the remaining errors are independent. We show that that implied um, that we could also write that down as y is just some errors where those errors uh, could be specified using this full covariance matrix. And so essentially that's, we could write that down by a little bit of refactoring and saying, well, you know, y is normally distributed around mu with some covariance matrix. And in this case, mu is zero because this error means zero and we're just having, you know, y is error, error is normal. So we've just substituted that back and we've now said mu is zero. Uh, again, because we've removed the trend, because we started from that assumption that we removed the trend uh, and are just looking at the autocorrelation and the error. Okay, so from that point, we can think about the fact that we've really written down things in the way that we've talked about a lot in the past. We've written down a process model describing the trend and a data model describing the error. And the only thing different here from what we've done in the past is that we have a, a capital sigma here for that full covariance matrix rather than having um, just a single constant sigma. Uh, but again, this is just modeling that covariance structure. It's uh, you know, once we know how to do that, then the rest of everything going on, our process model, our likelihood, our data model, you know, everything else is everything we've learned before. How we deal with it is the same as how we deal with it before. We just need to deal with that covariance model. Uh, we need to actually you know, formally put it in. So we can jump from having mean zero to now putting a model back in. So we could write down that mu has some, you know, you know, linear fixed effect model x beta and some random effect alpha. So we have some, uh, you know, mixed model here describing uh, mu, and then you know, now adding the fact that the errors are are autocorrelated. Or we could more get even more general and just say mu is some arbitrary function of x uh, with some parameters theta. And this could be any arbitrary nonlinear model of any complexity, or it could be as simple as mu equals zero. Everything in between is perfectly valid, and then we have this ability to account for uh, the autocorrelation and the error. Um, cool. So that I think that was a, a good uh, good place to stop, and we'll pick up here. Uh, and continue talking about difference models and moving moving average models.